Good evening. We're joined tonight by thousands and thousands of listeners and viewers from all around the world for the weekly Wednesday night cheer, followed this week by a uh, Fabrengen, by a, uh, a program dedicated to uh, the day and the night of Yud Shvat, the 10th of the Hebrew month of Shvat, which is the 58th yard site of the previous Lubavitcher Rebbe, Rabbi Yosef Yitzchak Schneerson, who passed away on Yud Shvat, Tovshin Yud, 1950, as well as the day that his son-in-law, the Rebbe, took over the leadership of Chabad Lubavitch on the 10th day of Shvat. This evening, we're going to explore something that is connected to a very fundamental perspective of Yiddishkeit concerning life and existence, but it's particularly suitable to the evening, to the night of Yud Shvat, of the 10th of Shvat. The previous Lubavitcher Rebbe, whose yard site, as I said, is tonight, would publish for every significant day in the Jewish calendar, a special Hasidic discourse. Especially in his later years, when it was very difficult for him to talk. So that would be substituted by communicating a discourse, a Maimur Chassidus, which he wrote, and then it was published to be studied on that day. As it happened to be, the 10th of Shvat, Yud Shvat, is the yard site of his grandmother, Rebbe Tzindifka, who was the wife of the Rebbe Maharash, the fourth Lubavitcher Rebbe, Rabbi Shmuel Schneerson. And his wife passed away in 1914, Tafri on Yud Shvat. So her grandson published a discourse to be studied on that day of that year, Tav Shin Yud, 1950. Actually, the Hasidic discourse, the Maimer, had 20 chapters. Five, the first five, he gave to be published and studied for Yud Shvat, the yard site of his grandmother. The next five chapters, three days later, for the yard site of his mother, which is on the 13th of Shvat, Rebbe Tzinshter Nesara, his mother. The next five chapters for Purim, and the final five chapters for Beis Nissen, which is the yard site of his father, the Rebbe Rashab, Rabbi Shalom Dov Bershneis, and the fifth Lubavitcher Rebbe. All in all, it's a discourse that contains 20 chapters. That year, 1950, Tovshin Yud, Yud was on Shabbos, Parshas Boy. And before Shabbos, this special discourse of the Rebbe was published and studied. That very day, of course, was the day that he returned his soul to its maker, Shabbos morning at 10 to 8, in his home on the second floor of 770 Eastern Parkway in Brooklyn. The funeral took place the next day on Sunday, the 11th of Shvat. And the following sections of the discourse were published in due time, a few days later, and then Purim, and then the second of Nis. The verse, the Dibur Amasch, the opening verse of this discourse, of this Maimer, is a Pasuk from Shira Shira, from the Song of Songs. Where Shlaima HaMelech, King Solomon writes, Basi Ligani Achaisi Kala. The groom says, I came to my garden to be with my sister and my bride. I came to the, my garden where we had Achaisi, my sister, and Kala, the bride. And as the sages, as the rabbis explain, Shlaima HaMelech wrote the Song of Songs the day that he built the Beis HaMikdash, he constructed the first Beis HaMikdash in Yerushalayim. And the whole book of Shir Hashirim, the whole Sefer, the eight chapters of Shir Hashirim are a powerful poem that describe the passionate relationship existing between a bride and a groom, between a kala and a chas. Shehashirim is a poem of eight chapters that vividly captures the tremendous love and affection transpiring between the groom and the bride as a metaphor for the profound love existing between Hashem, the groom, and the Jewish people, the bride. 
This verse, this Pasuk, in chapter 5 of Shir Hashir, is part of that poem. And according to the sages, it describes the day in which Moshe Rabbeinu built the Mishkan, the tabernacle. And thus he said, Basi Hashem said, I have come back to my garden to be with my sister, with my bride, with the Jewish people, because the tabernacle, the Mishkan, was the home that would house the divine presence in a manifest way. Now, the fact that the Rebbe published a discourse to be studied literally on the day that he passed away is obviously profoundly significant. Of course, initially it was understood that this was a discourse for the artset of his grandmother. But the very fact that there was a maimer that Hasidim were learning and studying that was dated, Yud Shvat Tov Yud, Yud Shvat 1950, the very day the Rebbe passed on, obviously is extremely significant. And as his son-in-law, the Rebbe, said more than once, that it's quite obvious that if by divine providence, the Creator had it that the Rebbe should leave the world the very same day when he published, the very same day, when he gave out this Maimah to be studied for that day, it was published before Shabbos, but it was dated Shabbos to be studied on Shabbos, Yud Shvat Shin Yud, that obviously is by divine providence orchestrated to give us a message that this essentially captures, so to speak, the final will and testament of the Rebbe, of the previous Rebbe. Although this wasn't a will, this was a Maimah, it was a discourse. But nonetheless, if it was a discourse given for that day, if everything in the world is orchestrated by divine providence, certainly everything related to the Jew and to a tzaddik and to a rebbe and to a manik Yisrael, to a leader of the Jewish people, there is no question that this discourse captures the final message, the final statement and declaration that the rebbe, the previous rebbe, wanted to share with the world and with his flock, with his students and pupils and disciples as he was about to bid farewell to our earthly reality. Indeed, it's interesting, at the end of the five chapters, the first five chapters, he discusses the fact that nobody knows their time. No human being is aware of when their time is up, and thus one should not procrastinate in life. And one should not delay things, because nobody knows when their time is up. Yet, <clears throat> we must assume that the opening verse, which is the name of the entire Maimer, Basi Lagani, Sikala, that opening verse first and foremost captures the message as this is the opening, the Psicha, which essentially encompasses the entire discourse that he published for the day that he passed away. It's in the opening vo- verse where we have primarily and prominently the final message of the Lubavitcher Rebbe, Rabbi Yosef Yitzchak, who passes away on this day. So this evening I want to share some of the ideas the Rebbe communicated about this in the Fabrengen of Yud Shvat Tov Beis, Yud Shvat 1972, in the Fabrengen of Yud Shvat Tov Shem Yud Shvat 1969, coupled with various other explanations related to this theme, compiled from various works of Torah, of Nigla, of Kabbalah, and of Hasidus. Let us begin by prefacing the fact mentioned above that Basi Lagani Achaisikala is a verse in Shir Hashirim in the book of Song of Songs. Rashi, in the opening of Shir Hashirim, makes the famous statement and he says, The world was an unworthy place until the day that Shir Hashirim, the Song of Songs, was given to the Jewish people. And Rashi continues to quote the Mishnah and Mesech Yadayim, that some of the sages doubted the holiness and the integrity of Shir Hashirim, being that it is essentially a love poem between a groom and a bride. And they doubted the fact that the Tanakh, that the Shir Hashirim belongs 
in the canon, it belongs in the 24 Sifri HaKadosh, in the 24 sacred books of the Tanakh. Amr Rebbe Akiva, Rebbe Akiva said, Chas V'Shalem, Kol HaSvarim Kadosh, Yerashirim Kadosh Kadosh. If all the other books are holy, Shir Ashirim, the Song of Songs is not holy, it's Kadosh Kadoshim, it's the holiest of the holy. This statement requires a lot of explanation. Number one, how can we say that the world was an unworthy place till the world did not receive the gift of Shleima Melech's eight chapter poem known as the Song of Songs, Shri When was Shri Hashirim written? The day Shleima Melech built the first Beis HaMikdash. This occurs more than 800 years after the Jewish people enter into the Holy Land. How can we delegitimize the existence of the universe till that point and say the world was an unworthy place? It was an undesirable place until the day of Shashim. Avram Avinu is garnished. Avram Avinu's life is meaningless. How about Yitzchak and Yaakov and Yosef and the Shvatim? And how about Moshe Rabbeinu and Aaron? And how about the day that the Torah was given to the Jewish people, Matan Torah? This did not justify and make existence worthwhile. This did not grant credence and legitimacy and confer dignity upon our world. And then after Moshe Rabbeinu, you have Yeshua, and you have the Skenim, and the Shaiftim and the Nevi'im, till Shleim HaMelech, and you have David HaMelech himself, David Avdi, David my servant, the author of Tehillim, the one who planned the Beis HaMikdash, and yet we say, until the day of Shirashirim, if you looked at the world, there was nothing worthy about it. Nothing worthy about this world. How can we conceive such an idea? And why is it Shirashirim precisely? From all the other works, you have Chamish Chum the five books of Moses dictated by Hashem himself. This did not make the world worthy. It was Hashirim that made the world worthy. What is the meaning of this? And why is it that Rabbi Akiva says all the other books are holy? Hashirim is Kaidish Kadashim. It's even holier than the other Svar. At first glance, it seems that the other opinion has it much more correct. The other opinion says, listen, Look at Shir Hashirim and look at the other books. Do you know, in the book of Shir Hashirim, there is not one moral message. There is not a single moral, ethical, religious, spiritual instruction or vision. It is essentially a very sensual, even graphic, love poem between the groom and the bride describing the affection in great detail, in magnificent prose, in eloquent words. The Tanakh is a religious work capturing the vision of Judaism, capturing the word of God as it were to the Jewish people and to humanity, each book in its own way, some through the history they tell, some through the mitzvahs they communicate, even the Megillah, which doesn't even have Hashem's name, but the whole story expresses the idea of the divine hand guiding history. In Shehashirim, you don't have Hashem's name mentioned, besides once at the end, Rishafah, Rishfayeh, shall have his yutke, besides that Hashem's name is not mentioned. There's not one moral message. There's no ethical instruction. There's no religious perspective. When we read it, what there is, is a very powerful poem and love song between a kala and a chas, between a groom and a bride. So the sages said, why does this belong in Tamach? Comes Rebbe Akiva and says, it's Kaidish Kadashim. Not only does it belong in Tamach, it's holy of holies. Not only that, the world was unworthy till Shri Hashirim was given. What does this mean? Now of course, if you read Rashi on Shri Hashirim, if you read the Medrash on Shir Hashirim, if you study any other of the traditional Jewish commentators on Shir Hashirim, they will all tell you immediately, Shir Hashirim is a metaphor. Shir Hashirim is a marshal, it's allegory. 
through physical imagery. Shleima Amalek is capturing the metaphysical relationship between heaven and earth, between God and humanity, between the Chassan and Kala, between HaKadosh Baruch Hu and Knesset Yisrael, God and the Jew. Granted, it's a metaphor. And that's why even Rashi, who usually explains Pshutish or Mikra, explains the literal meaning of the verses, in Shirashirim, as the literal explanation, he explains each verse as a metaphor describing the relationship between Hashem and the Jewish people. Because Shirashirim, the sages, Chazal understood, was a marshal, was a metaphor. And a very powerful metaphor with a very profound nimsh. But this itself begs the question. Granted, it's a metaphor. Why did Shleim HaMelech write it in a way that it then has to be stripped from its layers, stripped from its literal meaning, so that we should discover a new depth in Shir Hashirim, that when you read it at the first glance, you don't see it. Literally, we're dealing with a very physical and material phenomenon of life, a very powerful phenomenon of life, the concept and the energy of enor- which has enormous power of Ava, of love. But Shleim HaMelech writes it that way, and then we have to strip it from its literal meaning and convey the metaphor. When the rest of the Tanakh explicitly says what it wants to say, why did he choose to write Shir Hashirim this way? In fact, I read a few years ago, there was a debate in a newspaper. There was a particular publishing house that published Shir Hashirim. And it published Shir Hashirim with an English translation, but the English translation on the side of the Hebrew words was not the literal translation, it was already the nimshal, it was explaining the meaning behind the metaphor. In other words, they took the meaning of Rashi and they put it into the literal translation on the left side of the Hebrew word. So if you were looking for a literal translation in that particular translation, you couldn't find it. On the bottom they had the literal words, but in the place of the regular translation, it was symbolic rather than literal. Now their intentions, I understand. Their intentions was because Rashi says that if you want to understand Shri Hashir, literally you're making a mistake. It was essentially conveyed as a metaphor. But the question is, Shleim HaMelech also knew this. Why did Shleim HaMelech choose it to write it in these words? <laughs> there was a writer who then wrote a story, anecdotally. <coughs> you may agree or disagree, but the story is a good one. He was a writer, actually. Uh, he was a professor in Yeshiva University, and he was a great Yiddish writer. His name was Tzvi Kalitz, Olav Shalom, and he was a columnist for my father's newspaper, the Algemeine Journal. And he wrote in a story, a cute anecdote, that uh, there was a Jew in Warsaw, we'll call him Yankel Rosenberg, who, tra- who published William Shakespeare's Romeo and Juliet in Yiddish. So he wrote on the title page, he wrote... Uh, Romeo and Juliet by William Shakespeare. Ibigazet dun farbesert durch Yankel Rosenberg. Romeo and Juliet by William Shakespeare, translated and enhanced by Yankel Rosenberg. But in any case, coming back to our subject, Lahavdil, the question becomes why did he choose to write it that way? That itself is a message. But the truth is that it's precisely in this very methodology that Shleim HaMelech employed in writing Shir Hashirim that we can begin to understand the novel revolutionary idea that Shir Hashirim introduces and hence why Rabbi Akiva himself was so overwhelmed by the message of Shir Hashirim to the extent that he called it Kaidish Kadashim, to the extent that Rashi says that makes the world a worthy place. And this will be understood by prefacing a strange Gemara in Mesech the Chagigid of Yidal Ramad Beis. The Gemara tells that the story, Taner Abban and Arban Nechnesu Lepartis. There were four people who went into the mystical orchard. Ben Azai, Ben Zayma, Acher, Rabbi Akiva. Four people. Ben Azai and Ben the son of Azai, the son of Zayma, Acher. Who was, her name was Alisha Ben Avuya. And Rabbi Akiva, they all went into the mystical orchard. 
Amar Lam and Abakiva. Rebakiva told him before they went in. And listen to his words. Kshatan Magin Etzel Avne Sheish Tahir. When you arrive to the pure set stones of marble, Al Taimru Mayim Mayim. Don't say water, water. Why? Because the Pasuk in Tehillim says, Somebody who speaks lies will not endure before my eyes. The result was, Ben Azai gazed and he passed away. Ben Zayma gazed and he was affected. He went insane. Acher kitzitz ben Acher becomes a heretic. Rabbi Akiva Yatsa B'Shalem. Rabbi Akiva went in in peace, he came out in peace. The Gemara continues on the Aftasvav telling another story. Rabbi Yeshua ben Hananya was standing on a step on Harabayis, on the mountaintop in Yerushalayim. And Ben Zayma, one of the four, went into the orchard, saw Rabbi Yeshua ben Hananya, but he didn't get up. He didn't stand up to honor him. Ben Zayma was sitting. So Rabbi Yeshua ben Hananiah asks him, Ayayin or Ayayin ben Zoyma, where are you coming from? Why are you so overwhelmed? You can't even stand up. Amar Loi ben Zoyma says, Soifa Yisi ben Mayim al Yainim lo Mayim atachtoinim. Ve'ein ben Zelo Zelo Shalo Shetzboyaz Bovat. I was gazing at the space between the higher waters and the lower waters. And I see that between the two sets of waters there's only three fingers. And ten minutes. Three fingers separating the higher waters and the lower waters. Amr Rabbi Yeshua told me that. Rabbi Yeshua tells his students, Adayin ben Zayma mibechutz. Ben Zayma is still on the outside. And the Gemara continues discussing this at length with different opinions. It's an interesting thing. Rabbi Akiva told them, when you reach heaven, don't say water, water. Here, a few minutes later, we learn about Ben Zayma examining the space between the upper water and the lower water, and he comes to the conclusion there's three fingers. And Rabbi Yeshua says he's still outside. What does this mean? What does this represent? The Rebbe de Tzemach Tzedek, in Eid HaTayda, explains this as following. We know in the story of creation in Bereshis and Genesis, Hashem created a separation between Mayim al and Mayim Tachtayim. Initially, there was water that engulfed the universe, and then He created a firmament separating the higher water from the lower water. What does this represent on a spiritual level? Water is synonymous with pleasure. When we approach water, there is a certain delight that exists, seeing water, never mind being in water. Even small lakes or streams or swimming pools generate a tiny of pleasure, never mind larger units of water. Water produces all forms of pleasure. Water is a very pleasurable experience. Water in this sense represents pleasure. Till Monday, till the second day of creation, there was only one Mayim. There was only one definition of pleasure. The only definition of pleasure was godliness. Eneid Mulvadi, the only real reality is godliness, alakus. So the only true, authentic pleasure a person experienced in life was the pleasure he or she can get from connecting to the true reality, which is godliness. On the second day of creation, Hashem separated higher water from lower water, which means from that day on there are two forms of pleasure. There's the higher transcendental spiritual pleasure, divine pleasure. And then there's the lower material physical pleasure. A person can indeed glean tremendous pleasure from godliness. In fact, the greatest pleasure. But there's also another form of pleasure. One can get pleasure from physical indulgence, from addictions, from instincts, from habits. Some of them healthy, some of them never, never unhealthy. One can get tremendous pleasure from food, from nicotine from alcohol, from drugs, from serving his ego, from money, from power, from fame, from celebrity status, from ownership, from acquisition, from control, from manipulation. 
and what have you. I mean, the list goes on and on what a person is capable of getting pleasure from. Of course, one of the greatest pleasures a person is capable of getting from, if not the greatest pleasure, is from intimacy. And not necessarily from the spirituality of it, but on the other hand, it could be from a very physical element of it. And not only that, it could even sometimes be in an immoral and unethical and counterproductive ways, but it's still tremendously pleasurable. This is called Mayim Tachtainim Lower War. There are now two realities. There's heaven and there's earth, and there's a split between them. There's a dichotomy, there's a fragmentation. In fact, one can go their whole life. One can go their whole life pursuing pleasure, and pursuing comfort, and pursuing happiness, and it should never even dawn on them that there's something deeper that they're searching for. There's something deeper their soul is yearning for. They're looking for the real pleasure of life, which is the pleasure from the essence of everything, from the essence of food, and the essence of money, and the essence of intimacy, and the essence of the world, which is godliness. They're totally consumed by Mayim Tachtoin and by the lower world. Came Rabbi Akiva and he told his friends and he said, we're going to a very mystical place. Arba Nichnesul Apartis, as Rashi says, they went up to heaven. It was obviously one of the profoundest Kabbalistic experiences that occurred in history, where four of the great sages of Israel decided to experiment and leave the present domain of reality and cleanse the doors of perception now. Our perception is defined by a veil, by a curtain, by a partition. And they decided they want to transcend those veils and cleanse the vision, their, their doors of perception and see everything for what it is really at its core, which usually most of us don't have this opportunity. Comes Rebbe Akiva and says, Yisoyed HaYisoyed is the first thing you have to remember is, Al Taimru Mayim Mayim. Don't say Mayim twice. Come to Samach Tzadik and says, Rebbe Akiva was warning them about acknowledging that there is a true and eternal and inherent division between Mayim al and Mayim Tachtayim, between the higher waters and the lower waters. Rabbi Akiva said, if you're not going to be able to see how earth is a continuum of heaven, and how the body is a mirror of the soul, and how the lower waters can ultimately come to reflect and become synchronized and integrated with the higher waters, then there is a the tremendous danger that once you taste infinity, you will not be able to come back into this world and live a functional and normal and productive life the way God wants you to live because you separated the two waters. And when Ben Zayma comes and says that there's three fingers between the higher waters and the lower waters of Yeshua says, Adayin Ben Zayma Bebachutz, he's still outside. If he would have reached the core of existence, if he would have reached the ultimate truth, he himself would have seen there's no space between the higher waters and the lower waters, because although Hashem separated them, and He separated them to allow for us, for humanity, to demonstrate how we can integrate and synthesize the two waters, this essentially remains the objective of humanity. Hashem separated them only, or Hashem separated the two waters only as a catalyst, as an invitation to humanity to bring together the two waters and reveal as we say Friday night from the Zoya and Kigavna, to, create, to show the oneness, in the oneness, to show the oneness of both waters, to reveal the oneness of life, or as the Pasuk puts it, we say in Mincha of Shabbos, who was like your nation Israel, one nation on earth? So the Alter Rebbe teaches in the Geras HaKadosh, a magnificent explanation, who was like your nation Israel, Goy Echad Ba'aretz, that in Aretz, in earth, they reveal the Echad, the one. Showing that the higher water and the lower water are really one. And who is the one who warned them about this Rabbi Akiva? And that's why it's Rabbi Akiva from all people. Who nichnas b'shalom v'yatsa b'shalom. He came out in peace. Because Rabbi Akiva managed to demonstrate what is difficult for most to demonstrate. How the higher water could connect with the lower water. Most people when they have a mystical or transcendental experience, if it's genuine, if it's real, if it's deep, they can't bring it back down to this world. This world is defined by structure and by system and by organization. 
and by politics. I don't mean dirty politics, even clean politics, but this world is always focused with structures and systems and organizations and everything is with limitations. The moment they see the higher water, who could come back to the lower water? Only if you have the vision of Rabbi Akiva, understanding our time room, mayim, mayim. There's one God who pervades the higher waters and the lower waters. There's one truth that ultimately pervades both of them. It may be a different form. The lower waters may be a different form. But the essence of the lower waters is one like the essence of the higher waters. This can give the person the power to come back. And come back and still not lose what they received in the higher waters. Which according to this, we can now understand Rabbi Akiva's perspective on Shir Hashir. I asked before, why did Shleim HaMelech write Shir Hashirim in a way that can be very misunderstood, even till today? There are secular, love poems, very unholy, and sometimes very immodest, and they use phrases from Shir Hashirim. Why? Because Shir Hashirim wasn't written as a spiritual document, it wasn't written as a metaphor, it was written in very literal and graphic terms. Why did he have to do it that way? Why couldn't he l'chatchile initially write the nimshal what he means? Give us the symbolism behind it. Why does he have to first give us, why does he have to give us the poem and then we have to understand what the symbolism is? The answer for this is, this is the whole uftu. This is the whole revolution of Shashirim. Shleim HaMelech was religious enough and orthodox enough and heavenly enough and spiritual enough. He could have also written a book differently. He could have written a book that describes the passion between HaKadosh Baruch Hu and Knesset Yisrael, between the group, between the cosmic groom and the cosmic bride, Thank between you Thank you for using our service. Between God and the Jewish people. Shleim HaMelech could have done that. Friends and business associates to use it also. Goodbye. But what Shleim HaMelech wants to teach us is something far more profound. And that is this. The physical relationship between the groom and the bride, the physical intimacy between the husband and the wife, the earthly love that exists between the chassan and the kala is capable of mirroring and reflecting the transcendental love between God and Israel. al toimru mayim 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 tachtoinim essentially could reflect Mayim al -yainim. The body could become a mirror for the soul. Earth can become a continuum of heaven. Physicality can become a container that expresses spirituality. And not only it can, this is its true essence. True. Like any great power in the world that can be distorted. Love and intimacy, which are essentially such holy vehicles, which are essentially such powerful experiences which are essentially such spiritual experiences. Wherever there's tremendous power, you can also have enormous chaos. Wherever there's tremendous potential, there's also possibility for enormous distortion. And hence, in this particular area, life can be very distorted, distorted, and life can also be very counterproductive. But essentially, what is it capable of? Shleim HaMelech is telling us, the physical passion, the emotional feelings and affection between the groom and the bride on earth, is capable to mirror and reflect the deep, powerful, atomic love between heaven and earth, between God and the Jewish people. In other words, if you want to put it in different words, if you want to suck the marrow out of love here on earth, if you want to reach the deepest levels of love and affection and intimacy here on earth, it's only if, it's, if you trace it back to its true source, to its true origin, to its true essence, which is the love between Hashem and humanity, between heaven and earth, between soul and the body, between Mayim and Mayim, between Ruchmis and Gashmis, between the spiritual dimension and the physical dimensions. If the physical is detached from the spiritual, if intimacy of the body is detached from intimacy of the soul, if intimacy between the husband and the wife is detached from the intimacy between God and the world, then ultimately it is stripped from its true dignity, from its true depth, from its true power, and therefore from its eternal and power, true powerful qualities. It's using only a very external layer, and it has that much less power, that much less depth, and therefore that much less permanency. And one sees this literally. 
the more a love, the more a relationship is connected on the physical. At the moment, it could seem very powerful and overwhelming, but after a few moments, it it could become absolutely meaningless. And the person himself wonders, what was I thinking just a little while ago? The more the physical relationship becomes reflective of a spiritual relationship, both between a husband and a wife, which essentially is a reflection of the Abba, of the love between Hashem and humanity, then it has a real depth, a depth that is connected to divinity, which is eternal, which is timeless. This is what Rabbi Akiva meant, the world was unworthy till the day Shri Hashem was given to the Jewish people. Till the day Shri Hashem was given to the Jewish people, there were a lot of great people in the world. There were a lot of great things happening in the world. But the world was an unworthy place. What do we mean? The world itself, when you looked at the world, the world is physical, the world is material, the world is mundane, the world is earthy, it's unworthy. The whole worthiness of the world is merely that you can use it as a tool to grow spiritually. You can use it as an instrument through which to come closer to God. But the world itself is an unworthy place. It's an unholy place. It's a dirty place. It's an unethical place. Or to Kabbalistic language, it's Malay Klippis Besitter Achara. It's full of husks and shells and darkness and concealment. Came Shir Hashirim and changed our perception of the world. What was the, the, the primary contribution of Shir Hashirim? That the world is a marshal, the world is a metaphor. Which is why Shleim HaMalach didn't write it as a nimshal, he wrote it as a marshal. Because he wants to tell us that the world is a metaphor for God. The body is a metaphor for the soul. Earth is a metaphor for heaven. If you study earth, you can find heaven. Mipsari echzelika, Eev said. From my flesh I will perceive God. So the Alter Rebbe says, Midafshayin in the Basar, Bismis et zetart nalika. You have to strip away the layers of the flesh. You have to scrape, Midafshayin. You have to scrape through the flesh till you find their God, Echzelika. Don't run away from the flesh, but don't fall prey to the external layer of the flesh. The external layer of the body says, I just want physical indulgence, I just want physical pleasure, that's it I want. Comes the Apostle, Mipsari, Midafshayid in the Basar. Scrape away, peel through the layers, go deeper into the flesh, Echzelika, you'll find God. Because the world is a metaphor for heaven. Earth is a metaphor for heaven. And Gashmi's physicality could become an allegory for Uchni's for spirituality. Lo'yhoya ha'olam ra'yu. Shirashirim conferred dignity, legitimacy, and more majesty on the world. He said, look at the world. And instead of lamenting its properties, instead of eulogizing its entity, See it as a metaphor. If so, Rabbi Akiva says, the rest of the books may be holy, but Shirashirim is Kaidish Kadosh. Zakta Alter Rebbe and Lukuti Torah Shirashirim. The difference between Kaidish and Kaidish Kadoshim is Kaidish holy means aloof, sublime, distinct, separated. What's Kaidish Kadoshim? It's beyond being beyond. It's beyond Kaidish because it comes back down. All the books are holy, they're aloof. Judaism is the invitation to transcendence and the battle for transcendence. Shiashirim is Kaidish Kadashim. It's beyond being aloof, it's beyond being sublime. It's transcendent beyond transcendent, and thus it can be integrated into this world. Kedusha is going beyond. Kaidish Kadashim is taking the beyond and bringing it into this world. That's the uniqueness of Shiashim. And if we may add, perhaps, it's interesting if you want to, if you ask, what is Chsidis? Or what did Chsidis come to teach? Or what did Chsidis come to accomplish? So I think this is an interesting angle that can be cultivated because if you take the Alter Rebbe's works, the Alter Rebbe was, of course, the founder of Chsidis Chabad. So he has his magnum opus, he has a Tanya, he has Torah, he has Lakud Torah, with discourses on every parish of the Torah. But if you ask on which section of the Tanakh he has the most discourses, 
Take a look at the Torah and you'll see no question, hands down. She has Because in many ways, perhaps it's possible to say that Chsidis came to teach the world she has Chsidis came even to reveal in Judaism the she has Where in Judaism itself, there were perspectives and philosophies and Gdali Yisra who lamented the universe, who lamented existence, who used to describe the loneliness of the world and the tragedy of being in this world and the despicable components of the world. Chassidus comes to tell us Shir Hashirim, to help us understand how the world, how life, how every aspect of life can become a song because it can become a mirror for godliness. True, one has to be aware of how much we're capable of falling and of lowliness. You have to scrape away the flesh, but if you scrape in the flesh, you can find a lukah. Which according to all of this, this was an introduction, somewhat of a long introduction, to come back to the Rebbe's point that he made in the Fabrengen of Yud Shvat at base 1972 about the final message that his father-in-law, the previous Rebbe, came to convey with his last discourse given on the day that he passed away, Basi Lugani Achaisi Kawa, which is a verse in Shehashir. How does Shleima Amalek describe Hashem coming into the Mishkan the day it was built, Basi Lagani. I came to my garden. And the Lubavitch Rebbe, the previous Rebbe, chose by divine providence to give out this discourse beginning with these words for the day that he was about to leave the world. Now let's reflect on this for a few moments. Anybody who's familiar even a little bit with the life of the Bala Ilula, with the life of the Bala Yard site, of the Friyadik Rebbe, of the previous Lubavitch Rebbe, is aware that he lived through as a leader the darkest times of history and of Jewish history. Born in 1880, passed away at the age of 69 in 1950. In 1920, he assumed leadership of the Chabad Lubavitch movement in Russia. And under the circumstances, he became the leader of Russian Jewry under the reign of Joseph Stalin Yemach Shemai, who together with Adolf Hitler were the two greatest mass murderers in 5,000 years of history. Between those two, between Stalin and Hitler and their people, their henchmen, they murdered close to 100 million people. Innocent people. Men, women, children. Stalin himself. During the years of his reign, he, Lenin died in 1924 and Stalin died in 1953. So in the 30, around 30 years of his reign, sent to the gulags, sent to the firing squads, dozens of millions of people, historians argue, between 20 million, some 30, and some even take the number higher. A lot of people are unaware of this. Hitler's evil is more known what the Holocaust did to the Jewish people and to the world in general is more known. But the era, Stalin's terror, Stalin's evil, there were millions of Jews living in Russia. And he murdered millions and millions of people, non-Jews and Jews, anybody he suspected of being a counter-revolutionary. And the Rebbe himself, the previous Lubavitch Rebbe himself in 1927, was sentenced to death in Moscow, in Leningrad, in Petersburg, which became Leningrad. And then it was, uh, they changed it to a 10-year sentence to exile, and then three years, and then he was ultimately liberated a few de days later. It was miraculous, and there was enormous pressure from America and from other countries, and they liberated the Rebbe, and he left Russia. He left Russia physically, but he left behind thousands and thousands of students and pupils and disciples, and the rest of his life he dedicated on their behalf, on behalf of Russian Jewry. That was number one, and then you had Hitler. So the Rebbe, the previous Lubavitch Rebbe lived through the darkest times of Jewish history, seeing the depravity that human beings are capable of, 
a nation that prided itself as being the zenith of culture, a nation that prided itself as being at the peak of development and technology and philosophy and so on and so forth, this nation descended to the lowest depths of moral depravity in a barbaric fashion, unparalleled in human history, sent a million and a half children to be burnt in gas chambers, their smoke ascending in crematoriums, six million innocent people plunging the whole world into darkness and all in the name of ethics and in bettering the world. And the Lubavitcher Rebbe did not live through this era in a detached way. As a captain of the ship, as a man in Israel, as a leader for the Jewish people, this was his life, it was his intimate life. First of all, he lost many of his family members. His daughter was gassed in Treblinka, his son-in-law was gassed in Treblinka, uncles and aunts and many relatives. And never mind many, many Hasidim, many, many of his followers. Just as in Russia under Stalin, he lost thousands and thousands and thousands of his own friends or acquaintances or students or people that he knew and so forth. You may know in the 1920s and the 1930s, the Lubavitcher Rebbe built 600 underground schools in the former Soviet Union. Many of them were built and had to be closed and they were rebuilt somewhere else. Because the Efsekcia, communists, wanted to root out every aspect of Judaism from the former Soviet Union. He remained there and he was their arch enemy and he created an extraordinary underground network of institutions, of synagogues and of mikvahs and of schools and of rabbis and of teachers to try to preserve whatever he can of Soviet Jewry at that time. And when you look 70 years later, go to Soviet, former Soviet Union now in 2008 and you ask, who won? Who triumphed? Was it Vladimir Lenin? Was it Trotsky? Was it uh, Joseph Stalin? Who had an empire of hundreds and hundreds of millions and were very mighty and were extraordinarily mighty and had a huge superpower that they were leading in a very powerful way. And then you had one Jew who created an underground network of Yiddishkeit but 70 years later, communism is dead and Yiddishkeit in the Soviet, former Soviet Union is thriving. Chanukah, in the Kremlin there was a Menaita. So the Rebbe was not detached from these events. He lived through all of this on his own flesh. And as a leader of the Jewish people, those 30 years, it was the 30 worst years of Jewish history. This is in addition to the personal suffering. He was a very, very ill man. In his last years, he was paralyzed in half of his body. He can barely talk. And although tremendously active, he suffered physically tremendously. He's about to leave the world. What would you expect should be his final message? He's about to leave this cursed, dark, depraved world. Who knows better than him to quote your Miyal Anavi in Eicha? Ani Akevera Ani. I am the man who saw the affliction. He didn't read about the Besamikdash going up in the flames. He saw the flames consuming the Besamikdash. The Lubavitch Rebbe didn't read in diaries and newspaper articles and documentaries about what happened. He saw a European jury go up in flames. He saw a Soviet jury being decimated and destroyed day after day, week after week, month after month, year after year. He saw the whole world, the civilized Western world, remaining silent to the cry of millions and millions of hopeless, innocent people. That only crime was Jewish blood flowing through their sinews. Ani Agever, I saw this, I experienced it. And now he's leaving this world in 1950, only five years after the end of the Second World War. What would be his message? What would be an appropriate message? How would such a person summarize his life? It would be natural for us to assume that after living through 
such hellish years, the natural conclusion would be, thank God, I'm out of this place, wishing success to those who come afterwards to continue the battle in the very, very difficult and excruciating circumstances. It would be natural for him to express his disgust of Ilam Haza of this world, a world of lies, a world of corruption, a world of evil, a world in which wicked people can prosper and good people can suffer, and look forward to a world where there may be some more truth, some more innocence, where the good are rewarded and the bad are punished. This would have been a natural message. Came the Lubavitcher Rebbe and gave out his final testament on the day that he returned his weary soul to its father in heaven. And what was his message? Basi Ligani Achaisikala. That God calls the world a garden. He doesn't call the world a place of evil and darkness and perversion. Basi Ligani, I came back to my garden. True. A garden may have many weeds. A garden may have many thorns. And one has to uproot the thorns and uproot the weeds and cultivate the garden. But essentially, inherently, it's a garden. And the Rebbe, his son-in-law, in this Rebbe of Yitzvah said, He gave us a wondrous, a stupendous lesson in life. He said, I have been through everything. And I know exactly what this world looks like. And I'm leaving this world. But here is what I want to leave with you. I want to leave you with the message I want you to know. That life is good. And the world is good. And you ought to celebrate life and celebrate the world because it's capable of becoming a divine garden. What is a garden? An orchard that will produce a beautiful and magnificent aroma, great fragrance and delicious fruits. The garden has many challenges. The garden has a lot of evil. The garden is capable of producing people that are the lowest of the low, that are capable of doing things that are un-incomprehensible and afflicting innocent people with a lot of suffering. But this didn't allow the Rebbe to become an inherent pessimist, to stop believing in the destiny of the world to stop believing in the possibility of redemption, to stop believing in the potentially of human beings and of humanity, to find the spark of God embedded in every soul, and to find the spark of God embedded in every corner of the universe. Hashem saying, Basi Lagani, it's my garden. So you could look at the world and say it's a jungle, and when you read the newspapers or you hear the news, it seems like it's a jungle. So much senseless hatred, so much bloodshed, so much violence, one can easily despair and say, what is this place worth? This is a hopeless reality, a hopeless future. A war ends here, it starts somewhere else. Two ethnic groups stop fighting here, they start fighting in somebody else. You go to the Middle East, you go to Asia, you go here, you go to this, and in your own backyard. And the violence and the strife and the abuse and the pain and the suffering that people have from each other and from nature is sometimes horrendous and unparalleled. And it's easy for a person to give up and surrender and resign to the fact that whatever I do is worthless. Whoever I affect is worthless. Ultimately, this place is a random hefkerbelt, a random jungle, and there's very little to do. The Rebbe's last message on the day that he was leaving the world, knowing full well everything was, Hashem calls this place my garden. Where is this? This is a Pasuk in Shehashir. What is Shehashirim's message? That the world is a metaphor. It's a muscle for a nimshal. It's capable of reflecting heaven, because earth inherently is not bad, and it's not corrupt, and it's not distorted. Mayim, mayim, don't say mayim, mayim, the two waters are really one. Ultimately, the world is begging and yearning and crying deep down that humanity should place its mouth on the mouth of the universe and declare together, Yisgada of Yisgada Shmeirab. Have a wonderful evening.